Hi, this is Jefferson at Tubelandia. Please like and subscribe to my channel for all things audiophile and analog related and whatever may happen to come into my brain. Today, I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite albums of all time, At Fillmore East by the Allman Brothers Band. It is one of the top five live albums of all time on anyone's list by anyone's consideration. It's just absolutely fabulous. It's Southern Rock in New York City, produced by Tom Dowd, and it's just a magnificent album by any measure. Today, I'm gonna to be looking at just vinyl pressings, even though I have some digital and analog tape versions above my head. But today, it's just gonna be vinyl, and we're gonna be limited to a few specific audiophile pressings um, and the original. Starting with the original, Pink Label, Capricorn Release, Lacquer's Cut by George Pires, uh, produced by Tom Dowd. The 1982 Nautilus Super Disc Pressing, also um, mastered, or sorry, produced by Tom Dowd. All of these are produced by Tom Dowd. And digitally sourced, but still on vinyl, one of the early um, audiophile attempts for this album. Classic Records, Quiet Vinyl, mastered by Barry Grudman. 200 gram regular black vinyl pressing. A back in black reissue done about 2008. Um, one of the first uh, vinyl resurgent releases, probably around um, 180 grams. And it was introduced as vinyl was sort of coming back into vogue again, at least for the hipsters in 2008. Also in 2008, the classic records on the Quiax vinyl, clear vinyl, also mastered by, or lacquered crowd by Bernie Grubman. And last but certainly not least, the Mobile Fidelity pressing from 2015, um, mastered by Krieg Wunderlich, or sorry, lacquered cut by Krieg Wunderlich. And I'm sure I'm butchering his name. Sorry, Greg. So, at Fillmore East, why is it so fabulous? Well, again, it's the Allman Brothers Band, more or less inventing Southern Rock in 1968. In 1971, they were more or less at the peak of their game. They went to Bill Graham's Fillmore East to record two nights. March 12th and 13th, and these were captured on a mobile truck produced by Tom Dale and instantly became one of the top live albums of all time. I mean, it's always in the top five. You hear about this, you hear about Waiting for Columbus by Little Feet, Get Your Yaw Yaws Out by The Stones, pick your Jimi Hendrix in, in, out live album from that era. I mean, it's, it's right up there. And there's lots of highlights throughout this album. I mean, there's um, the King Curtis Soul Serenade, there's In Memory of Elizabeth Reed, Whipping Post, which takes up all of side four. So there's many things to um, recommend this album for. Uh, what I did is I listened to all these albums within the last month. Um, and then today I went back and listened to In Memory of Elizabeth Reed on all of these records and went back and listened to a few and I have some notes for that, which will apply pretty much for the whole album, because I think Elizabeth Reed is very representative of the, the goodness to be had on this album. But basically, um, you know, you introduce the theme, it comes back, there's bass, there's drums, there's an organ solo, and then at about eight minutes and 38 seconds in, the whole band starts to regroup and it starts to give you what's been planning for this whole time. And then nine o'clock, at nine minutes it starts to build. And at 9.30, oh my God, here it comes, it's twin leads. 
9.45, oh shit, what's going on? And then at 10 minutes, it pulls you back a little bit. And then at 10 minutes and 10 seconds, the guitarist twin leads start to build again till 10.26, oh my God, Dickie Betts is just searing the solo. And then comes back, go, go come back down. At 10.45, that blistering lead is kind of over, coming back. And then at 11.39, there's like a refrain of that same blistering lead. And it's just twin guitars, single guitars playing together, individual guitars following each other. It's just magnificent. I can't recommend this enough. The first time I heard the live version of Elizabeth III, I stopped everything I was doing. I went back, listened to it again. I listened to it like three times in a row. It's just that powerful to me. And I think anyone that likes the Elmer Brothers and likes live rock and roll will get what I'm saying. So I use that song as the benchmark to kind of listen to all these other pressings as I went through um, and did the critical listening to do this evaluation. Okay, reviewing these in no uncertain order. Let's start with the original OG Capricorn label pressing. On the pink rim. Fun fact, on my copy, side four, the label is printed twice. Side four. Side four. Although, one of the side fours is wrong. It's actually side one, and that gets us to what this orientation is. This original is in what I like to call the stacker format. There's probably a more formal name for it, but basically, sides one and side four were on opposite sides. Sides two and three were on opposite sides. The idea was you would have side one, side two, on a stacker record player, side one would play, side two would drop on top of it, grinding both records so you could replace them soon. And then you would play side two and then flip the entire stack over. And then side three would play, side four would drop, grinding the other side of the record so you're gonna to have to get the records, new rec copies that much sooner. And then you would play through for convenience. Anyway, that's how it was done back in the day. And that's how this record was pressed. Now. To the listening notes, the um, bass presentation, very good, very much there. And um, the cutting, overall the cutting was cut pretty hot. By the way, I did level out the gain at about 70, 75 dB for all these pressings, so it's an apples to apples comparison from that respect, at least. Um, the bass was there, it was, uh, but maybe more in the background than other pressings. The organ solo was definitely more prominent and clean and, and prominent in the mix than other versions I heard. Um, the part of Elizabeth Reed where Dickie just sears it, I mean, that was, wow, in your face, prominent, very nice, very distinctive. Um, and then when the lead comes back in, it's slightly understated and it builds again. Um, I, although that second lead after the initial searing of Dickie, I thought maybe it was mushy, but it was not. It was more of a, a more rounded presentation than everything else. Mushy is not a good word because I overall like the presentation, but it wasn't really prominent like the first lead and maybe with other pressings that I enjoyed. Um, the dynamics were great. Um, the bass and the drums were prominent but they were more kind of subdued in the background more than, than, you know, maybe other pressings. But for all intents and purposes, the original sounded right, right. Maybe it's because the, it's the version I've heard the most over the years, I'm an older guy. And so maybe that's what I'm most used to. But, you know, for the most part, there's nothing to complain about the original pressing. Everything's there and everything's nice. And, you know, it's somewhat affordable considering what other pressings and audiophile pressings are going for. So the original's great.
One more thing I forgot to mention about the original, the lacquers were cut by uh, George Pierce, and uh, he's one of those mastering engineers that's kind of being having a resurgence, a rediscovery as mastering engineers become more coveted. And uh, there's a lot of initial pressings from the 70s and also reissues that he's featured on, and he's always got a good reputation and his sonics are always outstanding. Next pressing we'll look at chronologically is the Nautilus Super Disc pressing from 1982. Now, as you know from um, Steve Westman and other YouTubers, uh, a lot of these uh, Nautilus Super Disc are basically early digital transfers to vinyl. And so they have some artifacts and some of the things that go along with early digital. With this pressing in particular, what I've noticed is that um, it was cut very quietly uh, maybe the one of the quietest of the ones I looked at. Uh, maybe it was because they're trying to capture the dynamic range, although I didn't find the dynamics that exciting with this compared to, say, some of the others, uh, especially the original and the uh, Clarity Classic Records. Um, the bass was somewhat diffuse and also a little bit flabby at the same time. So it was kind of like not tight, not well-rounded, and also kind of down in the mix. So that was uh, kind of interesting. What I did notice immediately, however, the soundstage seemed very wide, like almost artificially wide, definitely beyond the speakers. Like the, And the other sound stages were essentially that way too, but this was very noticeable. And then I realized why. It seemed like the, for whatever reason, the guitars were panned hard left with the Nautilus and more so to where um, both guitars were on the left side, nothing was really in the middle, and um, it just felt like an overall artificial presentation. Not that there's anything wrong with it, it's just when you play it A, B with some of these other um, pressings, you see the difference. And um, yeah, so probably not my favorite, but also, you know, not a shabby pressing uh, compared to the other ones either. Moving along, we get to the uh, Classic Records 200 gram Quiet Pressing. This is the one that's on the black vinyl. Um, it's mastered by Bernie Grubman in 2003. Uh, they, he also did the Classic Records 2008 Clarity, which I'll get to later. Uh, I'm assuming it's from the same metalwork, only with different dates and different vinyl, but someone maybe knows more can correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. Um, okay, the Classic Records. This also had the wide, uh, wide sound stage, but it was like a you know regular wide sound stage, uh, for lack of a better word. It it sounded natural. Um, the dynamics were the best of uh, any pressing I'd heard, and uh, the bass is clear, distinct, right. The drums are very distinct. They're clear. They're in the mix where they should be, but they're not overpowering. They're not overly prominent. The guitars were centered and then uh, slightly to the left, but not as far panned left as the Nautilus recording. Um, and the drums were probably the most distinct and clearest of any pressing that I listened to. Um, this was just a great pressing. Pre you know, presentation was natural. The soundstage was natural. Everything sounded the way it was supposed to do compared to say the original pressing, but there was slightly better dynamics and just a little bit more of an oomph to this pressing. So this is the one that is probably closest to the original, at least to up to this point. Next on the comparison train, we have the Back in Black 180 gram repressing, um, also from 2008. So what can I say about this pressing? I think it was done 
as vinyl was possibly coming back to the certain extent it was in the early, you know, the, the mid to late aughts. Uh, certainly that's when I was starting to kind of get back into vinyl after being off of it for 20 years. Um, in terms of what this gives us, um, the back in black, um, somehow the guitars were both veiled and shrill at the same time, which is kind of a, a master stroke and a unpleasantness. Uh, I'm not sure how they pulled that off. Um, the bass was almost hidden behind everything else. Couldn't really find it. Uh, it felt like the guitars were struggling to erupt from the mix, which in this type of album, guitar-centric Southern rock, you don't want. Um, one thing I did notice that we, the organ solo during Elizabeth Ree, it seemed kind of fuller um, and it was separated out from the other instruments, but it was also more rounded off. So as a result, it was just, you know, not that great of pressing. Um, so, you know, it's 20, $30 on Discogs right now. There's probably a reason for that. And um, yeah, it's better than nothing, but I don't recommend it. Okay, last but certainly not least, the mobile fidelity pressing of that film race. This was, the lacquers were cut by Cree Wunderlich on this one. And as you can see, it's a mobile fidelity sound lab and not original master recording like most of these are behind my head. So what this means is that mobile fidelity could not confirm that they were using the original master tapes to press this. So they cut this from what they had available. If anyone has more information on what they used, ex exquisite, uh, ex explicitly, please let me know. But anyway, in terms of the listening notes here, um, this one had nice, clear, heavy bass. The, ba the, 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 the most prominent, full, in-your-face bass of any pressing. It wasn't even really close. I mean, if bass is your thing, this is probably the one to get. I mean, is this an artifact of mobile fidelity and the, the smiley face EQ where they boost the low and the high end? I don't know. They were probably not doing this by 2015, but you know, 2015, a lot of crazy shit was going on with those guys. So who knows what they actually used and how they actually, what their intent was when they pressed this. Um, anyway, clear, heavy bass. It intertwines in and out of the rest of the instruments. It was very, very nice. Um, the imaging was okay. I mean, you could hear everything distinctly. Not the best of the ones I looked at, but certainly not the worst. And certainly, um, uh, the drums um, were good, they intertwined well, they featured prominently with the bass. And the, you know, the guitar, the twin leads here were exquisite. Maybe not as distinct and defined as on the Clarity vinyl, but very pleasant and very nice. And this is a great, great presentation of that Phil Maurice. However, it's probably also the most different of the ones I list to. Is it because it the different tape? Probably. Uh, I'm not sure how much the mastering could have affected it. But the MoFi was good. It goes for incredible money right now, like 200 bucks. And that I don't understand. Um, it's great on its own, but it's more like its own artifact. I would say it's the best pressing, but maybe the most unique of the ones that I listen to. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. A lot of people love that MoFi and they're gonna keep loving this and it's still gonna sell for $200 regardless of what I think. But um, if you love the Allman Brothers band, you love this album, and you want the definitive pressing, this is not the one I would start with, but it's fun to have us hear something different. Now, we can, in terms of something different, up above my head is all the different digital and eight track quadraphonics and real to real that we have of this that I'm gonna get into later when I talk about digital versions of this album or actual quadraphonic surround sound versions of this album or whatever, but for now, we're talking about vinyl, and this is interesting, but it's not the best. Next up, we have the Classic Records on Clarity Vinyl. So this is the, uh, their version of um, UHQR, uh, the early MoFi, 
Uh, it's a, it's on an opaque vinyl, very distinctive if you've never seen one. Also on the original pink label. It's a clarity vinyl. So it looks a lot like UHQR, which it is, but it was under the Michael Hobson regime um, when they called it clarity. So unfortunately with this pressing, the Clarity Vinyl came out towards the end of Classic Records' run, and so, unfortunately, a lot of times you'll get a Clarity Vinyl and there's smooth, crisp mastering, clear dynamics, but for whatever reason, there's also a lot of surface noise. And so, this one did have a little surface noise, unfortunately, but it wasn't terrible, and, you know, I actually cleaned it a couple extra times and got most of it off. But the pressing notes, all that being said, it sounded great. I mean, the bass was super prominent. The guitars were right. Um, it was dynamic, uh, probably the best dynamics of any pressing, including the original that I heard. Um, the drum, drums are clearer, more distinct. Uh, everything just felt right. The um, organ, when it, the organ solo during the bass, you could hear both the organ and the bass separately. It was very nice to kind of hear the bass swirling around like it's supposed to be and very tight, very distinct bass, but not too full, not too flabby, not too rounded off. Um, even in the twin leads, in the twin leads when Dickie and Dwayne are playing the exact same notes, note for note, you could pick them out distinctly. You could pick out Dickie um, on the left and Dwayne a little bit more centered. Uh, I mean, it's easy when, when Dwayne's playing slide and Dickie's not, then you can do, sell, tell the difference, but even when they were playing note for note towards the searing part of Elizabeth Reed, you could hear them distinctly. It's so amazing, it's so magnificent. I, I really, really like the Quiet Expressing and um, I can't say enough about it. I mean, it's probably the best I'd listen to. And the fact that it's going for like under a hundred dollars still on Discog sort of amazes me. But um, that's the classic records as Clarity, not Quiet Clarity. So yeah, so far, my favorites are these four. OG, the two classic records, and the MoFi. Now, the rest of the mix. Um, this back in black sucks. I, you know, they did their best. I'm not sure, well, they did something. Um, you can do better. Okay, if you made it this far, I appreciate it. And I hope you found my notes interesting and possibly helpful. Um, what's the summation? Well, in my opinion, at this time, in 2022, here's my breakdown of these pressings. My favorite, I've got to say, is probably a toss up, but I'm gonna give this slight, slight edge to the original. It just sound. Oops, that's not it. The original. It just sounds right. It has it clicks all the bells and whistles. Um, everything's where it's supposed to be. Everything sounds great. Everything is dynamic. It's just exceptional. This is the one to get. You can also pick this up on Discog still. A George Pierce uh, master version for, you know, $25 for VG, maybe $50 for VG+. Plus. I paid a little under $100 for this near mint copy. Stunning. The MoFi is twice this and doesn't have the same dynamics or presentation. I don't understand it. Get the OG if that's, if you want the best sounding or one of the best sounding and the original mix and the reason this thing is so popular in the first place. Okay, second, by a very, very small amount, and depending on the day, maybe I'd like it better. It's it's hard to say. But my second favorite of these was the Clarity Vinyl. Dynamics almost as good as the original, probably better imaging, better in-your-face guitars, better um, overall mix, the bass was very prominent and distinct without being flabby or overblown and just could just loved it. It was just great. 
So followed closely behind by that one is going to be the other classic records. And that would be this one, the Qui X 200 gram. I've suspect it's the same metal work, the same mastering. Uh, Bernie Grubman did both as the 2003, or sorry, 2008 Clarity. It's a little bit earlier, um, so this is the one to get afterwards. For some reason, these uh, classic records are both, I think, underpriced on Discogs right now. Both were running under $100, so um, that's something to think of if you don't can't find original or you want to go up to a slightly better audiophile. Finally, the Nautilus Super Disc. So with this one, it was okay. Had a wide sound stage. Um, you know, it was, uh, the bass was kind of low in the mix. It wasn't really that great. Not my favorite, um, but better than the Back in Black. So to summarize again, OG, Clarity, Quiex, MoFi, Super Disc, Back in Black. Don't bother with the Back in Black. Super Disc is interesting, but not essential. If you want to put the resources towards the best pressing, get an OG or one of the two flavors of the classic records. Um, supposedly Hobson's stuff, all this metal work went to Chad, so Chad may have it. So Chad, if you're thinking about it, you want to do another um, repress, UHQR, I don't know. Looking for suggestions, you got the metal work? How about this, buddy? But not that one. All right, that's Jefferson from Tubelandia. Please uh, comment uh, if you have any uh, questions or suggestions or anything of that nature. Please like and subscribe because I'm going to be doing more Allman Brothers videos and comparisons and um, more interesting stuff down the road with uh, quadraphonic stuff, uh, two-track master tape, and of course, vinyl and anything analog. All right, thank you again. Please like and subscribe. Jefferson at Tubelandia. Bye-bye.